Good morning, everybody. And oh, try this again. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, my sew along. So, for those of you who don't know the format, um, I'm going to be sewing and talking about a variety of things, hopefully, mostly medievally related. And if you have questions, pop them into the chat and I will answer them. Um, so, this morning, I'm going to be working on possibly two projects, at the very least one. I'm going to be working to finally finish The Smock of Woe. <laughs> um, but along the way, I also bought some books to share with you um, because I've had bought I've been a bit of a bibliophile, which is a problem when you live a um, military lifestyle because it means that you move around a lot and you actually have a weight allowance. Anyway, I have been making some very interesting purchases recently. I'm gonna angle this down a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. So I've been making um, a bunch of purchases recently, um, some very interesting books that are relevant to um, medieval clothing, medieval culture, medieval uh, daily life. Because for me, you know, I do all of this not just so I can have interesting clothes, which I do like as well, but you know, I really I engage in all of this exploration of the past because there's a part of me that wants to experience the beautiful aspects of the past firsthand, all of them, you know, the, the material culture, the social culture, the interactions, the courtly culture, the literature, the philosophy. Um, yeah. So um, as you can see here, here's the smock of woe. And uh, I know that unfortunately, I think my camera is on my laptop anyways, not the best quality camera. But um, so you can't see necessarily, but the stains are all out. <laughs> for now. We'll see if I put any more stains into them. I did manage to remove it all uh, with that stain, the stain remover that I have, plus the combination of vinegar and lemon juice and sunlight. Seems to have bleached all the stains away. <clears throat> uh, oh, welcome, Elizabeth. It's good to see you <laughs> for the first time in a while, actually. I appreciate that you comment very often. For those who don't know, um, if you really want to support your creators without, and maybe you don't necessarily have the finances to financially support them, one of the best ways you can support us is by leaving comments under the videos on YouTube. A lot of people think leaving comments under the videos if they're posted on Facebook supports us. It doesn't. YouTube is not connected to Facebook at all. So if you want to support your creators, always leave a comment under the video, even if it's just an emoji, a kitty emoji, whatever. doesn't have to be serious. Engagement is engagement. And the YouTube algorithm gods recognize that even a thumbs up in the comments means that there are eyes on the screen and that this creator creates things that brings eyes to the screen. Anyway, um, one of... Uh, one of the books I just sort of recently finished reading that was new in my library was this fantastic Address History of Korea, which is a revolutionary publication for those of us interested in historical Korean fashion because until very recently, until this book basically, most of the literature was in, well, Korean. <laughs> um, and even then, uh, as far as I can tell, based on what the Korean authors of this book have said in their presentations on YouTube and also in the book, there wasn't necessarily a lot of uh, scholarship published on historical Korean fashion because Korea is just now coming to a place where they can explore their history from the luxury of comfort. <laughs> Um, you know, whereas in, in, in Europe, it was in the 19th century when a whole bunch of aristocrats and um, upper middle class individuals, the leisured class, uh, had the time to actually really start exploring historical European fashion, medieval fashion specifically, and started really delving into all of these amazing primary sources and publishing all sorts of papers. So a lot of the best scholarship on medieval European clothing was done in the late 19th century. <laughs> And some of the resources that those scholars cite, unfortunately, didn't make it through the two world wars. Yeah, which is kind of sad. Um, but in Korea, they're just now getting to a place where they can actually explore their own fashion history because they have the resources. They're no longer struggling to survive. They're thriving. Korea is a rich country now, so it's no longer a an issue of where your next meal is going to come from for the majority of people. So once you reach that stage, you can start exploring your history from the lens of luxury, so to say. 
So that's what dress history of Korea is all about. And it actually starts um, pretty ancient fashions, like 2000 years ago, and goes all the way up to traditional Korean dress, um, not only in the modern world, but in a very, very good chapter on K-drama, historical fashion, and pointing out you know, some of the more popular K-drama and where that those particular shows got the clothing right and where they got it wrong and the sort of choices that the costumers made to sacrifice authenticity in the name of whatever it is they're trying to present. So yeah, this book, I can highly recommend it, Address History of Korea. It's very, I mean, it's expensive. It's like $100, um, which I know for some people is not expensive and for some people is like a week's wages. So uh, it's $100. Um, there is an e-version that's not much less expensive. As you can imagine, this isn't exactly a bestseller <laughs> in the world. So they, they can't afford to do like a mass production run and make up their printing and publishing costs through mass, mass distribution. If you have the funds and you are interested in Korean fashion, the history of Korean fashion, I really do recommend this. They've got, they've got extant garments in here that I've never seen anywhere. And I've been trolling around the Korean internet for a long time, looking for some of these medieval extant garments. They've got a medieval portraiture and art that I haven't seen depicting clothing. They talk about the dangers of using portraiture to interpret fashion because um, you may, some many of you have heard this before, portraits uh, tell a story. They're not always, they, they're rarely just a pure, factual representation of a person, whether it's a historical person, a legendary person, an allegorical person, a pseudo-historical person. Often a portrait contains elements that do not reflect daily life. They reflect themes. And I don't know why the light keeps changing in and out. Sorry about that. Um, they reflect themes of power, of influence, virtue, honor. So, you know, that just because they're carrying a flower in their hand doesn't mean that people walked around carrying flowers in their hand. For instance, that flower is telling the viewer a story. It's conveying meaning. So, um, yeah, you can't always take what you find in portraits at face value. And one of the interesting things in Address History of Korea, they pointed out um, that many historical portraits, especially the older ones, didn't actually survive the Imjin War, which was when Japan tried to march through Korea to China in the late 16th century. And the Joseon said, no, you may not. And they fought a war. And unfortunately, one of the things that the Japanese liked to do in this war was set things on fire. And so a lot of the medieval portraiture didn't survive, but Koreans, Korean culture, Joseon culture was very, um, uh, very, uh, not just ritualistic and ceremonial, but very regimented from a bureaucratic standpoint. So when they recovered from the war, they repainted. They had many of the portraits repainted, but from memory or from sketches. And so the repaintings were no longer contemporary to the original painting. And so the repaintings were not done necessarily faithfully to how the originals were and incorporated contemporary elements of clothing and style. And so this is another cautionary tale about how even though it might be a portrait of a real person, it doesn't mean that the person is wearing the clothes they would have worn in their lifetime or even on, on a daily basis. So yeah, it's a good book. I can highly recommend it. Um, right now, I am just, I'm that panel <laughs> that I've mentioned in a couple of my most recent shorts, I am attaching the panel and I'm not going to pick it up and show it to you yet because the pins aren't in place, but then I'll show you what I'm doing. Basically, this is my smock, my my newest smock. It'll be the first new smock I've made for myself of a Franco-Burgundian style smock in 14 years. <laughs> um, and my other smocks are literally wearing away. And I mean, they have, they have a butt, <laughs> they have a butt wear. You can see I sleep in my smocks when I, when I, when I go to medievalist events. And so um, you can see where my butt cheeks are <laughs> because there's spots that have worn away. The linen is literally just worn away where my butt is coming in contact with the bed and pressing down into the mattress. And so there comes a point at which you just can't rescue fabric, a, a garment anymore. When the fabric starts to literally wear away and you, you, you putting patches on is just putting patches on disintegrating fabric, it's time for that garment to become something else. 
And in the medieval period, it, if there was enough fabric, it would have been cut into another garment, maybe a smaller one for a smaller human, <laughs> maybe a child, um, the pieces that were not completely disintegrated, or it could have been used to stuff <laughs> to insulate walls, as in the case of many castles I'm finding out, including the famous amongst fashion historians Schloss Lengberg in Austria. There's another castle in Italy, a privately owned castle, where the same thing has been found. They have found a whole trove of textiles in the walls and floors. Unfortunately, it's privately owned and the owners do not want it getting out about this find. And they've, they're in direct contact with a pair of Swedish fashion historians textile historians. And those, unfortunately, they have been bound to not give the name of the castle. And they're also not allowed to publish their findings because it's this private collection. So I'm really hoping that someday that will change because a trove of equivalent garments from the 15th century in Italy, where you have extant undergarments and overgarments, fragments that show us how people sewed, how they finished seams, how um, how they approach different t tailoring challenges. That would be great to have for Italy because right now we've got it for, for sort of Central Europe, Holy Roman Empire. That's where Langberg was at that time. But that doesn't necessarily tell us how things were done in France or the Italys or Spain or Burgundy or, or England. I mean, it might've been, they might've been using many of the same techniques, but there's no guarantee, you know, Europe is not a monolith. It's not a monolith now, it wasn't a monolith then. So I'm really hoping that this castle find in Italy will eventually, they, the owners will eventually give permission for the items to be explored in a more official and public fashion and then published. That would be just really great. In the meanwhile, <laughs> um, so the back to what they do with what you do with old linens. Um, medievally, they also turned it into rag paper. By the 15th century, there was a thriving paper industry in Europe now, paper was still super expensive and it was made not from wood, but cloth. That's what linen paper literally was. Rag paper was made from the rags of, of, of cellulose, of, of plant fibers. So um, linen, hemp, cotton, not animal fiber. Apparently that doesn't make good paper. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's about the structure. It's about the cell structure. And that's why we use wood now. It's the cellulose from the wood that we used to make paper. Back then it was the cellulose from, from fabric. So you would literally take the scraps the rags as were that it, at that point had just been basically rendered as, as useless as possible. You couldn't even use it anymore probably to wipe surfaces down. And they would go through this, they would soak it um, for a, you know, like a week or so, maybe even longer and, you know, water with universal solvent. <laughs> and then they would be beaten. The, the rags, the rag pulp would be beaten and then um, it would be, uh, you know, because they, they had beating mills. I mean, they had mills with, driven by water. You know, medieval culture was actually highly industrialized in the sense of things were, a lot of things were water driven. There was a lot of water power driving mills, especially um, also forges had water driven forges where they could actually, the hammers were actually driven by the water power, um, which is how you could mass produce certain things like armor and weapons. And so they would, you know, the pulp would be beaten and then it would be sieved on screens and then, um, you know, dried into paper. And so, you know, a lot of, that's why there aren't many surviving linen undergarments. It's not just that they rotted away, it's that they were recycled into paper. So a lot of medieval linen undergarments became books eventually, which I guess there's a certain poetry there, but it's frustrating from a fashion historian perspective. <clears throat> So this particular smock, um, I started assembling five years ago, geometric construction. It's a, I bought this really great linen here in Korea. It's fine. It's light. Um, it's densely woven, which when you want, honestly, with linen, what you really want for the most part for most clothing applications is relatively densely woven, not necessarily thick, but a large fiber count because those that that it's a stronger fabric that will last longer. And I started making this five years ago, when at that point I recognized the need for more smocks. And then other projects kind of rose up. I made a, my 15th century style Phoenix costume and for my Feast of the Phoenix ball at Penzik. And then I started working on, oh, this, this behind me, my, my new Jornea. This has also been in the works for about four years, <laughs> maybe five, I think, 2018 or 2019. Um, and 
then this smock got packed away by the movers, just as they do. They just randomly grab things and throw it in boxes. And it got packed up in a box with, God knows, some other thing containing a liquid that stains. And um, then it ended up in a box that didn't get unpacked for about four years with the staining thing pressed up against it, things. Because it was also put in a box with something with red fabric. And for those who don't know, red dye stuff is one of the least stable dye stuffs out there, which means that uh, in the presence of moisture and heat, it will most assuredly transfer onto anything that's in contact with it. In fact, <laughs> you may or may not be able to see in this light, but this, this dress is yellow and used to be white striped. It is now yellow and pink striped because it accidentally got washed with a red t-shirt not a historic garment, a modern red t-shirt. And so now it is uh, yellow and likely pink. And that's okay. I don't, it's, it's fine. It's evenly pink. It's not tie dyed, but lesson is that you want to keep your red clothing items away from your white clothing items, unless you want red stains on your white clothing items. Now I managed to get the red stains out of this and the oil stains and the Penzik mud stains, and the stains from the corrosion from the pins, from soaking the pinned up garment in a vat of vinegar water. And there was another, oh, and I managed to get the stains from the wood stain on the bench, from the bench on which I dried it in the Penzik sunlight. I got all the stains out. So now we're finally to the stage where I patch up the center gore this is the center back gore, which turned out to be just too short somehow. I don't know what happened, but the center back gore ended up being too short. And my choice was to either cut the whole thing off to be the same length as the back, or I guess to leave a weird, chunky, <laughs> chunky spot in the back with like this weird, very square or trapezoidal hole <laughs> in the back, or to patch a piece on. And so I'm patching a piece on, which if you look at a lot of extant undergarments and even extant overgarments, you will see patching like this, where it was obvious they either ran out of fabric and weren't able to create a complete cut in that panel, or they made a mistake. Either way, I had I have enough of this linen left to be able to actually cut a nice little rounded trapezoid out and pin it on. And it's looking pretty good. Now, one of the things I did when I took into consideration when doing this, and you should too if you're doing this, is grain. So you might have, say, a scrap that's big enough, but it's on the bias. I mean, you can do that, but it's not ideal because you're going to get weird bias stretching happening, especially if you wash it and hang it or you know to dry or when it goes on your body, the bias is going to stretch differently than the main part. So I made sure that the piece I had lined up in terms of the grain so that the weave the warp and the weft of the linen are basically they run all the way down to here so that this is not bias cut and you know bias cut has its uses if you're making hosen bias cut if you're making a 19 a slinky late 1920s early 1930s dress bias cut but bias cut will be very annoying <laughs> if you don't want it it will create strange warping in your garment that you may or may not want. So I think I've got this all pinned in now. Um, you know, the problem with doing patches like this is you have to make sure that you don't have that the two fabrics are the same tautness, right? You don't want to pull one extra taut when pinning the other over top of it. So they need to be the same tautness. And I can see here that I've got some bubbling. So there's some spots where the tautness is not the same. So I'm going to have to do some repinning. Yeah. Oh, wait. Possible question. How many smocks do you have in rotation at a time? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Um, question is, how many smocks do you have in rotation at a time? The smock is, for those who don't know, a smock is the base linen layer. And that's the English word for it. The French call it a chemise. The Italians call it a camicia. The Germans call it a hemd, right? This is all, except in the English, <laughs> this is all just the word for, an, you know, um, Camisa in, in Spanish, this is all just the word for shirt. So, you know, in every other language, shirt, the word for shirt as was, as the undergarment, whether women's or men's, whether long or short, has sort of made it into the modern language. But in English, we stopped using the word smock. I don't know why. Normally, I know random um, 
etymological crap like that. We have to look that up. Anyway, um, I have, if you do long events like I do, like two week medieval living history events where you're living medievally for two weeks, I have at least, I have four smocks. Four, I have four Franco-Burgundian smocks and three Italian camite. <laughs> Four, four Italian camite. Um, and that's because I don't want to spend the entire event doing laundry. <laughs> um, because this takes, this does not, this not only takes the dirt, you know, it catches the dirt from the your neckline and um, around your wrist. It also catches the dirt that your skirts vacuum up when you're moving across. If you're a lady who has, or if you have long, long skirts, whether men or women, because men also had garments that dragged on the ground, depending on your period and culture. Um, you know, it, the garments that when they even just brush the ground, they don't have to drag like a train. I don't mean that. I mean, just if your hem goes down to the ground, even, even to the top of your foot, then it will kick up dirt and will vacuum the dirt up into your your leg area. And so this, your camicha, your shirt, your smock, your hemp, your chemise catches that dirt. And so after a couple of days of wearing the same camicha, it's pretty dirty and it doesn't really feel good anymore. So I, I recommend, I recommend normally one smock for two days, you know, and, and that's if you're willing to do laundry. <laughs> um, it also depends on how much you move, how, active you are, how much you sweat, how hot the event is. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into how many smocks. But I like to have for, you know, a two-week event, four Franco-Burgundian style smocks for my Franco-Burgundian fashions and three to four Italian camice. Um, and I, I like to have that many also because if one fails, which does happen often, <laughs> um, and needs repairs, and I don't have time for the repairs, then I have backups also. So, yeah. You know, I guess I guess the answer to the question of how many smocks should you have in rotation is maybe different than how many I have, but how many you should have kind of depends on your own personal level of cleanliness. I know some people who have to shower three times a day at events. I don't know why their skin hasn't flaked off of their bodies yet, because human skin wasn't meant to be soaped really at all, let alone that often. But, you know, if you are, are that level of fastidious in terms of your hygiene, then probably you will want more linen undergarments than fewer because it is the linen undergarment that really takes the hit. Okay, I'm just going to redo some of these pins. Yeah, so um, I'm heading to Chiang Mai in October, actually three weeks from now. Three weeks? day is it? Three weeks from now. Yes. Three weeks from now. Four weeks from now. I'm heading to Chiang Mai, which is an amazing, gorgeous, uh, the historic capital of one of the medieval kingdoms of Thailand. And um, the there's an SCA group there. And at my prompting, <laughs> we're having a medieval event there in Chiang Mai, in this amazing uh, historic place. And if you don't know what Chiang Mai is? Go ahead. If you're out there in your own world, go ahead and take a quick, do a quick search, and you're going to see why I'm going to Chiang Mai. It is, it is one of the most beautiful places in Thailand for those who like histor history. Um, it's also up in the north of Thailand, which means it's not as hot. Bangkok is a steam bath, and it's also kind of a big modern city. It's very smoggy. It's very dirty, and I mean that literally. It's, you know, lots of cars, lots of traffic, constant constant cars everywhere. And so all the smog and the oil and the rubber from the tires. Yeah, Bangkok is not my favorite city in the world. Um, it has some nice things, but it's, you know, not my favorite. Um, whereas Chiang Mai is up in the north and it's a much smaller city and it's, uh, yeah, much more historic and much cooler. I mean, cool is relative. It's only going to be like 85 degrees instead of 95 or 100 degrees. So I'll take that especially with 98% humidity. <clears throat> so I'm hoping to have this done in time for Chiang Mai to have a nice new linen undergarment to subject to tropical levels of heat and humidity. And yes, I will be wearing my full kit there. I've done two events now, two medievalist events in 
in Thailand and I, I got fully dressed. I did. And I survived. I didn't die. So a lot of people say, oh, you can't, you know, the medieval, medieval Europeans dressed the way they did because they could, because it wasn't hot and it wasn't humid. It isn't like it is wherever this, the interlocutor says they live. But uh, you've been to Europe, you've been to the Mediterranean. There are many places in the Mediterranean, especially in the summer, that get very hot and very humid. And I do mean 95 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, so 38 degrees centigrade with 98% humidity you know, 90% humidity. So they had heat and humidity, but they had, they didn't do what we do. <laughs> As a lot of, especially American medievalists, they didn't go out in the middle of the day and engage in armored combat or dancing or anything. When you live in a hot and humid place, most hot and humid places, the same is true of Asia. They don't go out in the middle of the day. They go inside, they go out in the morning, they go out in the evening and the night. They don't go out and do things at the hottest part of the day, <laughs> which is our mistake. <laughs> so it's not necessarily that they dress, they dress like they did because it wasn't hot and humid. They could still dress like they did because they didn't do things in the hottest, most humid part of the day. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, favorite Thai dishes. Goodness. I question is, um, what are my favorite Thai dishes? I love, um, green curry, green Thai curry, red Thai curry. Um, I love um, masaman curry, which is kind of more, it's, I mean, you might think that's, it is kind of Malaysian too, but it's definitely um, very, very common. It is on the menu commonly in Thailand, at least it is in Bangkok. Um, yeah, I, I love um, Tom Kha Kai, uh, which is this wonderful coconut milk chicken soup. Yeah, there's a lot I love. I love the flavors of Thai cuisine. Lemongrass, oh, so wonderful. I actually eat the lemongrass. I might be the only person who does that, but I, I actually eat the lemongrass if it's not too chewy. <laughs> as long as I can chew it and swallow it, I will eat the lemongrass. Um, a lot of people just leave it in the bowl. Not me. I love lemongrass. So yeah, there's there are quite a few Thai dishes, and you know. But what's really interesting is to try to imagine any Asian food cuisine without peppers. Because of course, Thai curry, I mean, it's founded, the, the curry paste, it's base, most most largest component is either, you know, green peppers or red peppers. And those didn't get to Asia until the Dutch traders brought them in like, in some cases, the 18th century, they didn't even get there. So in Korea, they didn't have gochu until the 18th century. So to try to imagine these cuisines without them is is really interesting it just must have been i mean the food just must have been so much more delicately flavored it was less less violent <laughs> i guess is maybe how a westerner would view it without the violence of those those high capsaicin peppers in the cuisine it must have been so very interesting um yeah, I mean, imagining Korean cuisine without red pepper because it's like the fun red pepper paste gochujang is the fundamental part of it. Like in Thailand, green peppers are in everything. We went to an island once, this tiny little island um, near uh, sort of two hours south of Bangkok, and it was it was not a it was not it was a it was a Thai tourist island, meaning an island that Thai people went to to go to the beach. And we went to the beach, and there was this lovely little food stall on the beach. And um, we ordered this thing that looked absolutely delicious on the picture. It looked, it looked, was a, it was this chicken stir fry. It smelled so good. And it had all these little, it had a, it had vegetables in it. And we ordered it. And they brought it, the, the lovely lady who operated the stall brought it to us and we <laughs> we sat down to eat it and it was jeweled with all these lovely red and green vegetables and we took one bite and we realized to our horror that the hundreds of little pieces of red and green scattered all throughout this beautiful delicious smelling chicken stir fry was <clears throat> Thai bird chili peppers whole whole Thai bird chili peppers, more Thai bird chili peppers than chicken. I was able to eat 
one bite. <laughs> and then my mouth was just on super fire. It was, it was, it was as though someone had put a superheated element in my mouth. <laughs> and there were a little pile of lovely fresh cucumbers sort of off to the side on the plate. And I tried to use the cucumbers to cool my mouth down, but unfortunately the evil red juices from the stir fry had come in contact with the um, <clears throat> cucumbers. And so the cucumbers were also off limits. And uh, my condottiero, God bless him. You know, I hate, we hate wasting food. And he fought, he fought hard. He likes spicy food. He fought hard. He got through seven bites and then had to call uncle. And what was the worst part about it, this platter was this big and it was heaping with chicken. And, um, you know, we, we were, we were, there was no option for to go container besides which we couldn't have eaten it anyway, even if we had taken it with us. So we had to leave it. And I really hope to this day that when the lady came in, the lady, as soon as we left, came and collected the dish and ate it because I really felt badly, but we just couldn't, we couldn't do it. Which brings me back to the idea of, I really do wonder, I do wonder what it must have been like when before, um, you know, before the Colombian exchange, the Colombian exchange brought so many, many new and fundamentally cuisine altering ingredients to Asia, potatoes, tomatoes, corn, peppers, um, you know, all of those were new world. They didn't exist in Asia. So yeah, just how, how amazing something like that can be. And it didn't, it, it, it didn't take long. Once they'd arrived, it didn't take long. It took longer for some of those items to get to parts of Asia than most people think. But oh, something just fell down in the other room. Yeah, so I'm now waxing my thread. Um, and this is actually, some of you might get a little irritated when I say this. This is actually very fine silk Korean embroidery thread. Um, but I needed more white thread and silk specifically. Um, I really like sewing with silk thread. Linen is an option too. Linen, of course, frays a lot more than silk does. And we do have some of the extant garments, uh, the extant <laughs> garments, the extant fragments we have of linen and small things from the 15th century. Some of them are sewn with, with silk thread. So it isn't just that linen meant that you sewed with linen. So some of some of them are actually sewn with silk thread. So it is an appropriate practice. A lot of them are also sewn with linen, um, flax, flax thread. So I'm going to go ahead and commence the sewing on this now, and I'll go ahead and show you how it looks. So this is, uh, see, there's the patch at the bottom. You can only sort of tell <laughs> that there's a patch. And this is this is going to be on my back um, and I'll I'll be frank. I've taken a very I've developed a very medieval eye for tailoring, um, which you know in the modern world, especially with industrial sewing machines and that sort of thing, we have developed a very very an eye that that prizes ultra neatness in seams and in finishes, um, and that's not such a thing in a lot of medieval clothing. Um, a lot of medieval jewelry too. If you really start looking at medieval, extant medieval jewelry, of which there's not much relative to how much there was, you can actually see that they weren't so concerned about the finishes either. Actually, I think I can scoot forward now. They weren't, they weren't so concerned about the finishes either. I could actually sit on one of my sitting cushions, I guess. Kind of a strange idea to sit on a sitting cushion. They weren't as concerned about the neatness of anything, of how the seams met, of how patches looked, of top stitching. Uh, um, they definitely didn't seem to care about colors of thread matching with the garment. I mean, in the case of white garments, they used white thread, but white thread was cheaper than dyed thread because dye stuffs, remember, super expensive medieval dye stuffs were. <clears throat> You know, that's another aspect of, of historical clothing that a lot of people don't really consider. Um, and that's dye stuffs, because modern dye stuffs are so cheap that there is, you know, there's 
no appreciable cost difference to the consumer between white linen or dyed linen. Not true for medieval cloth. Medieval cloth, dyed cloth was massively more expensive because dye stuffs, natural dye stuffs are expensive and you usually need a relatively large amount of them to create the kind of deep colors that you want. And, you know, some dye stuffs in and of themselves, not even talking about the quantity, just the per unit cost was super expensive. So that means that dyed cloth was absolutely more expensive than undyed cloth. And ergo, dyed thread was absolutely more expensive than undyed thread. And you can definitely, that's completely borne out by the inventories and the expense accounts, uh, by wills. You know, there's a lot of places where we can get an idea for how much things cost. Now, of course, then getting in, you have the cost, but the cost is in, say, florins. So what does that tell you, the modern the modern person? What is the value of a florin? Well, then you have to start, you know, for historically, what you can do is you can look in the, like, say, look in expense accounts to see how much workmen were paid. And then it sort of starts to give you an idea, well, if a if a baker was paid, you know, a hundred florins a year, and I'm, this is not, this is, I'm just pulling a random number. I don't know how much bakers were paid in any part of Europe at any time. That is not something I've ever looked into. But hypothetically, if a baker were paid a hundred florins, um, a hundred florins a year, and, you know, a man at arms was paid, you know, 200 florins a year, then if, you know, a length of fabric costs a hundred florins, right? Then you're like, wow, that's that's a that's a sort of mid-level artisan's annual salary for a length of fabric. Wow, that's actually pretty expensive, right? So that's how you can start getting an idea of the relative cost and value of things and how... The Hotel de Cluny has, uh, is the place, it's a, it's a museum in France, for those who don't know, uh, medieval, uh, the, it is the museum of the Middle Ages in France. Like it is, there, there are many that have medieval items, but the Cluny in Paris is one of the primary collection points for medieval artifacts and objects, not just religious, but daily life as well. And they have a textile collection. And back in the midst of time, when I was a student in Paris, um, I went to the Cluny for the first time, and that is probably where I saw my first extant medieval garments in person, maybe. First non-armor related medieval garments in person, because I had seen some in, in London, but those were all, it was all armor related. And uh, the Cluny has a massive textile collection. Of course, not all of it is on display. They, they, that's just, it's not efficient. You can't keep everything on display. But one of the items that they had on display was a silk lampus chasuble. And lampus, for those who do not know, is kind of like a brocade with a um, geometric repeating pattern usually, usually circular or like dodecahedral or hectagonal or something like that, usually depicting like little like lions or some kind of, um, you know, floral motif sometimes as well. And this chasuble, even though the Cluniac order, the, the Cluniacs were a very powerful, very well-to-do order in the Middle Ages, this chasuble was consisted of about 20 to 30 different pieces of the lampus that had been puzzled together and sewn together to create one whole piece of fabric. And it was very clear that no consideration was paid to the pattern at all. It was all about maximizing the use of this really expensive fabric. And instead of, there were some seams, some proper seams in it, but many of them were sewn in this manner, wherein you lay one layer over, uh, slightly overlapping the other layer, and then turn the raw edge under and stab stitch it to create an extending piece like this. And so that was my first clue about, A, um, just how expensive fabrics must have been, how valuable they must have been, even for the wealthy, you know, because the Cluniac order was not poor. They could afford fine things, but even still with a fabric that probably costs the equivalent of $1,000 a meter in today's terms, um, they eked out every last little bit of it. And... And it wasn't a question of lining up the pattern. The stitches were not perfect either. 
which is also my first, my, my, the first time I really had a, you know, an aha moment about, ah, medieval tailoring doesn't have the same uh, aesthetic rules about perfection of stitches that we do today. So that was, uh, yeah, that, that garment was, was a very eye-opening moment for me. And then as I started traveling through more of Europe and then came to live in Europe for 12 years and went to every single little village museum we could find, there was nearly always at least one medieval thing in, in even the little tiny town museum's collection, often more than that, or at least one medieval textile item. You know, then I really started seeing that, you know, perfection of stitchery, of, you know, perfect clean finishes weren't necessarily such a priority, even on items that were intended for very well-heeled people. So, yeah. Yeah, so those, so yeah, if you, um, you know, looking at looking at extant garments in person is really something I I wish I wish more of you know especially my fellow American medievalists could do because you can look at them in the pictures um, and unless the pictures were taken by you know professional photographers with proper lighting and you know sort of um, museum quality photos, then you're not going to see the same things that you can see in person, especially if there's a glass case and there's a reflection off of the glass case. And yeah, it can be an eye-opening experience to actually look at a medieval garment. And if you're lucky enough, like I have occasionally been to actually touch medieval textiles, see them, feel them with your fingers, see them directly with your eyes, really up close and personal, it's, that's also a really eye-opening experience. So now I'm just stab stitching this panel on. And then once I stab stitch the panel on, I'll worry about straightening up, um, you know, having it connecting it here at the seam that goes down to the base. But I'm kind of optimistic that this might actually get done. Uh, so, right. Um, I brought some other books with me. Um, this is a book that is available. Um, it's called Inventories. Unfortunately, that shows backwards, like unlike ambulance. Inventories of Textiles. Um, and it's published by VNR Unipress, um, Universität Wien, University of Vienna. Um, and this is really great <laughs> because inventories are a really excellent way to get an idea of the, th the materials that went into making clothing. The actual colors, the actual fabrics, the actual weaves, the linings, the interlinings. And this is actually a series of, of essays written by different experts in different fields starting from, um, let's see, I think the earliest is 12th century. The introductory chapter is also 1300. So um, the first one is on inventories and textiles of the papal treasury around the year 1300. And, you know, papal treasuries, the papal treasury is an immense collection of really crucial, crucial items for the study of medieval material culture. And I'm not going to get into the morality of, or or debate the morality of the um, the Vatican's collection, um, but I will say that I'm grateful that they have it, <laughs> because because the papal state has this immense collection of items that have been donated over the centuries, for the most part donated, by the way. Um, we have these things we can look at because the world wars were really bad for medieval items. A lot burned up, a lot was destroyed, a lot got melted down. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad they have this collection. Anyway, that's really great for the study of material culture because they have all sorts of embroidered items, textile items. And so, um, you know, the inventory, what they've done, what this thing has done is it's gone through this inventory from 1300 and it's found the actual items that they think align with the inventory. So you can see how the inventory was documented, how the inventoryist looked at the item and recorded it and what it actually looks like in real life. So that's, that's, really, that's really quite fascinating. So that's chapter one. And there's all sorts of, in fact, here's Olympus. 
Yeah. Um, oh, no, sorry. That's embroidery, not Olympus. I'm not going to show you that as Olympus. Um, but there are actual, you know, there are actual extant tunics in the collection. And even though some of these tunics might not have been like, that's a Dalmatic. Still, the tailoring techniques used in that are very useful for helping people who do 13, late 13th, early 14th century tailoring to actually sew their garments together, for instance, because a seam is a seam is a seam. Um, then the next chapter is on um, the Bishop of Freising um, and his inventories. And so that's from the early 14th century, so first quarter of the 14th century. And so, you know, here's what an inventory looks like, by the way. Oh, light. Sorry, the lighting is really bad. Yeah, so if you ever wonder what it's like to be a historian, you have to look at things like this <laughs> and figure out the language and the paleography. Right. Um, so that's chapter two. The ones that really interest interest me, though, because I you know focus. They've got more. They've got several different 14th century inventories that they explore. There's a chapter on reading Royal English inventories, and this is this covers like the basically the reign of Henry V, but not just Henry V's inventories, his his relatives, the royal peers of England and their inventories. So it talks about the Bedford inventories and um, uh, the Lancastrian, uh, Lancastrian inventories. And what's interesting about these royal inventories is that at that time, of course, the kings of England were also sometimes the kings of France and they had holdings in France. And so a lot of the fashions and the clothing talked about, it's French and English fashion. And one of the more disturbing inventories, disturbing, fascinating inventories that they talk about in here <laughs> is the inventory of the items of Henry V that made it back to England because he died in France. He died on campaign of dysentery, I think. Um, he died on campaign and um, well, unfortunately dysentery was a very common way for great puissant knights to die in battle. Um, when he died, his things were sent back to England. And so this inventory is a list of the items that actually made it back to England. So they are they were basically the last, most likely the last items he had made for himself, like his most recent garments. And these inventories literally talk about, they go into some of these, some of the Henry V's inventories go into super detail about his arming garments. They talk about the top fabric, the shell fabric. They talk about the interlining. They talk about interlining number two and lining number one. So one of his arming, one of his arming doublets, his poor points, had a silk damask shell, of course, because he's the king of England and he's also the king of France, actually, at the time. Um, and he is, or he was on his way to being the king of France. That's what he did. Was he for crowned as the king of France? His son was. Ugh. War of the Roses and uh, and that whole the Hundred Years' War gets, gets kind of messy. I'm more interested in the material culture than the goings on at, at at that level of the court anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, his it was there was a silk damask shell, a lining of wool, and then two linen linings. So, um, you know, people talk about, well, wasn't that really hot? Well, it was probably not cold, but depending on the wool that you used, it should breathe just fine. Actually, the layer that might make it not breathe so well of all of those layers the least breathable layer is actually the silk damask because silk um, silk is fine and great in dry climates and heat. But if you add humidity, it gets very stuffy because um, uh, silk does not absorb moisture like linen does. It's not hydroscopic. So the, the moisture will not be absorbed by the silk to then be evaporated by, you know, evaporative cooling. So it will just kind of it against your skin. However, the layers linen is hydroscopic, so the linen layers would have pulled, would pull moisture, will pull moisture, and with it the heat that's trapped in that moisture away from your skin. Uh, wool does an okay job of letting the moisture continue through as long as it's not boiled wool or fulled wool. Um, and then, you know, maybe those warmer, the warmer layer, warmer air would get trapped there between the wool and the silk rather than against your skin. 
but yeah, it's uh, it was really fascinating to see all the layers that go into several of his. Another one of his had a linen lining and a silk shell, and it actually specified cotton wool as the padding. Yeah, so um, very, very interesting book. I can highly recommend this Inventories of Textiles. Um, it goes on. It also has, for my Franco-Burgundians out there, very exciting. It has, it's published, um, at least not, not necessarily the entire thing, but parts of and analyzed. There's an essay analyzing a purchase account from Charles the Bold and finding getting a hold of inventories and purchase accounts from the reign of Charles the Bold, the last last proper Duke of Burgundy can be really challenging. Uh, I really, I feel like I've got to go over to Brussels, go to the archives there, go over to Dijon, go to the archives there, and maybe just start digging myself because I can't imagine that they don't exist. It just seems that all the scholarship that's been done to date has been interested in the court of Philip the Good, in the court of John the Fearless, and even um, Philip the Bold, the the founder of the Valois line of Burgundian dukes. So uh, finding a purchase account of, of from Charles the Bold is really, really excellent. And purchase accounts are different than inventories because they give different details. So purchase accounts can actually sometimes will detail the amount and kind of thread that was purchased to make garments. It will detail the linings, all the linings that were purchased to make garments. And sometimes inventories often especially if they're posthumous inventories, unless the lining is of value, they don't mention the lining. So if it's lined in linen, inventories tend not to mention it because the linen is kind of not the expensive fabric relative to, say, the silk damask shell. So inventories often ignore the linings of garments unless those linings are expensive. And they tend to ignore the interlinings of garments unless those interlinings are expensive. So having both you know, having inventories and having purchase accounts, really great window into what goes into making a medieval garment. And depending on your period and place, you may have more of those available or fewer of them available. So yeah, this was this was a, a great publish. Funny enough, there's also an essay on the inventory of Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, which is available in the a selected inventory of which is available in a book called At Home with Lorenzo. Um, but the essay in there actually does an analysis of, of the linens and the bedding in the inventory. So that was an interesting read because of course I've read, I've poured over the inventories multiple times, but I never really analyzed the bedding and, and um, napery to the extent that this essay does. And it's actually quite fascinating to see all of the amount of tablecloths and napkins and towels and sheets and matching sheet sets and canopy sets that Lorenzo had in his home upon his death. So, you know, sometimes these essays, uh, these essays are obviously secondary sources because they're an analysis of a primary source, but they often contain um, excerpts, you know, quoted wholesale, which will help you it itself is a primary source, the excerpt the excerpt. Um, and, but also the thought process, the, the analysis can be very eye-opening and can put you as a fashion historian, as a medievalist, as a living historian, as a reenactor, can put you onto ideas that maybe you didn't have before. So it's very useful to read essays like this if you're, if you plunge as deeply as I do down this rabbit hole of insanity. Uh, and let's see. Then, then after that, it starts getting uh, the the essays because it's it's arranged by time. The book is so it starts in 1300, the earliest period the es covered by the essays, and then they actually get into up into 17th century inventories, which gets really interesting um, from a hypothetical perspective to me. I'm not particularly excited by the 17th century. I, it's just never. It's a horrible century. <laughs> in Europe. It's a really terrible, terrible time. The Thirty Years' War, my God, it's so harrowing. Um, and of course, the witch hunts of the 17th century, it's just, it's a really nasty period of European history, especially if you are on the bottom of the rungs of society. But this, they, have, they have a couple, they have multiple inventories from the 17th century where they actually include scraps, swatches, fabric swatches, 
of the fabrics that are discussed in the inventory. So that's what this picture is actually. These are actually fabric swatches in this 17th century inventory. And that is, that's really neat. <laughs> that's pretty damn neat. They literally sewed fabric swatches onto the vellum. Um, that's, a, that's a really great idea. And I'm very upset that my medieval inventorist didn't have the same thought. <laughs> <laughs> to sew swatches into the um, inventories. In fact, in 17th century finger loop braiding manuals also have the same thing. A lot of the 17th century braiding manuals also have samples of each of the braids sewn into the vellum with the, with the instructions so that you know what it is you're supposed to get, which is big improvement over the medieval finger loop braiding manuals because they don't provide any visuals at all. <laughs> <laughs> no visuals of the braid you're supposed to get, which means reconstructing some of those instructions challenging because you don't know where it is you're heading. Whereas at least with, uh, you know, it's like cookery for a lot of a lot of recipes in medieval cookbooks, you don't know actually what it's supposed to produce because a lot of those dishes, most of those dishes don't exist in modern cuisine. Whereas 17th century finger loop braiding manuals provide you with little samples and apparently also the fabric and textile inventories also provide you with samples of the textiles in question, which is neat for being able to see how they use words to describe a visual. It's, you know, words are very inefficient medium for describing anything visual. <laughs> and if the visual thing moves, i.e. dance, it's even more inefficient for describing uh, visual phenomena. So yeah, pictures, the, 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 the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words is yeah, literally true. So that's another book in my collection. Let's see. Um, Oh, this book, <sighs> for those interested in extant garments. <clears throat> Textile Conservierung, okay, which means textile conservation. And the book is in German. This is a book published by the Abeg Foundation, the Abeg Stiftung in Austria, excuse me, Switzerland, not Austria. And the Abeg Foundation, look at this beautiful, look at this. Get that beautiful imprint on the cover. I love cloth covered books so much. They're so elegant. Anyway, um, the Abeg Foundation is an organization that restores historic textiles from ancient to relatively recent. They have a workshop and they've been restoring textiles for decades at this point. And Granted, some of their restoration efforts, their earlier restoration efforts may not have been the best and probably did damage. <laughs> um, but the good thing about their restoration efforts is that when they restore a garment, they take in-depth pictures of every stage of the process and up-close pictures of the before garment, the before restoration garment and the after restoration garment, and also of all the seams and the stitches and everything. So the Abeg Foundation has restored many, many, many garments, many of them in private collections, which means you may have never seen pictures of them otherwise, because the only place that they're photographically documented is by the, in the Abeg Stiftung. And they have published this book called Textile Conservierung, and um, you can still buy it. And I think there's an English version too, but I, you can find this. I got this for $20 on eBay because it's damaged. The binding has come away. I, I keep saying I'm gonna glue it, that's all I really have to do. But because it's damaged, I got it for $20. It was a library book that had been liquidated, basically, and put out there for sale. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, I should say, if you're watching, um, please do hit the thumbs up button. It helps with the algorithm. <laughs> anyway, back to the Abeg Stiftung. Um, you can find this book, keep your eye on eBay, you can get this book. Um, it, it's really, really, really useful if you care about stitches and weave and um, they, they've restored embroidery, they've restored tapestries, I'm trying to find a famous garment. They've restored what many people mistakenly call the Charles the Bold coat, it is not. Um, 
But here, for instance, is a 16th century suit that they restored. So 16th century suit of before restoration. And then you start seeing the pictures of the process of restoring. And, you know, they show it in the bath water so you can see how they wash. Look at this up close details of how the hosen were put together. Look at how nice and complex that is, but how comfortable that would make it on your feet. Make it for the fit. Right, so you can actually see how the stitches that were used on the garment, then they provide detailed diagrams of the pattern for all of the garments. So this book really is a, a must have. I would I mean, it's a must have, nice to have. For me, it's a must have. Depends on your level of geekery. Um, so, you know, because even if it's a religious garment, the stitches are still the same kind of stitches that would have been used on secular garments. Um, and especially for those of you who, who like weaving, they, they show the details of the warp and the weft. And in some cases, they'll show you a reconstruction of the kind of loom that was used to make that particular fabric. So yeah, Textile Conservation, I feel like is a definite must have. Um, and you can find it, it's, it's no longer, it's out of publication, obviously, but you can find it on eBay. You can also sometimes find copies on Abe Books, on Biblio. Trying to think where else I may have found it. And if you're lucky, like I was, you can find a copy that a library is removing from their collection and just looking to get rid of. Get a copy for $20 instead of, I think I once saw them selling for $500 because it is out of print. Yeah. So that's another book in my collection that has been very useful in my exploration of medieval garments, of medieval embroidery even. What was really interesting, one of the pieces they restored was a gorgeous piece of Opus Anglicanum um, embroidery, which is the really beautiful like 13th to 15th century embroidery that, that has shading and you know lots of beautiful details, you know, all created by this intricate split stitchery. And in the 19th century, the nuns in this monastery noticed that there were some bare spots that had developed over time on this hanging and they covered everything with their, with really crude 19th century satin stitching. They covered the beautiful Opus Anglicanum in this, in this very crude satin stitching. And so come the 1960s or 70s, I guess, the then nuns, <laughs> the 1960s and 70s nuns, um, sent, submitted the, the hanging, I don't, I don't remember if it was a chasuble or a tapestry, well, not a tapestry, a wall hanging, because tapestry is a weave, not an item. Um, they submitted the, the, the item to the Abbe Stiftung, the Abbe Foundation for Restoration. And the Abbe, when the Abbe Stiftung removed the stitches, there was still all this beautiful opus on Gakanam underneath, because they didn't know what was going to be underneath. They just knew that there was, you know, something. And it was in many places perfectly preserved. So it just needed to be filled in in a couple of spots to be, to be, to be reserved, to be restored to what it was. And thankfully, because those nuns <laughs> covered it with that terrible satin stitching, the way in which they did it actually protected the medieval stitches from degradation, from exposure to artificial lights and sunlight and all of that. So actually, it kind of did us a favor for those of us who care about the actual medieval stitchery. <laughs> so yeah, in many cases, restorers have to counter the damage done by past restorers. It's like archaeology, you know, um, what Heinrich Schliemann did to the real Troy, he should burn in hell for, I have feelings. <laughs> because he was just a gold dig, literally a gold digging treasure hunter. Like that man... He just wanted to get the gold. And so he dug through the layer that was actually the Troy of the Trojan War until he reached some kind of, you know, 2000 BC civilization layer. And he literally used dynamite <laughs> to blow up the tell. For those who don't know, Heinrich Schliemann was the man who uh, <clears throat> excavated at Troy, the real Troy, um, and uh, in Turkey, in modern day Turkey. And he used dynamite <laughs> to blow through the top. I don't know, I don't remember, about 15, 20 feet of the hillock 
to get so that you know, they can move quickly. <laughs> he just used dynamite to blow it up and get it out of the way. So God knows how much cultural material culture was just lost forever in that in that cataclysm. <clears throat> So yeah, uh, fabric con fabric conservationists, clothing, textile restorers often have to fight the damage done by poorly done past efforts. Uh, in the case of that coat I mentioned, the so-called coat of Charles the Bold, um, it was it was taken entirely apart. So the entire original stitching was lost forever. So we have no idea how the garment was actually sewn together. Um, and that wasn't, it wasn't documented at all. And then it was put back together incorrectly <laughs> and then it was misidentified. Um, so the so-called code of Charles the Bold, it dates to the 1520s, not to any era of Charles the Bold. And even if part of it may date to the time of Charles the Bold, the garment as is doesn't reflect anything basically about that time or, or his, or him because it had undergone such modifications in the 1520s to bring it into a 1520s style Waffenrock fashion that it, it does not, it just doesn't reflect, you know, what thing, fashionable items of the 1570s. <clears throat> so that's the other danger of historic garments is that people tended to wear garments for decades until, you know, we reach the point, as we mentioned earlier, about falling apart and be being turned into either wall insulation or rag paper. So they tended to wear them for, or in some cases they got turned into bags, pouches, seal bags, that sort of thing. And so that means that often garments were modified to reflect the latest fashion trends or to reflect the size of a new person. <clears throat> so even for the extant garments we have, the question is always, well, how long, for how long was this worn? And does it reflect its original state? A modified state, uh, you know, there's all sorts of questions that can come up. Now, in the case of certain garments, for example, like the extant farsetto doublet of Giorneo di Cavaniglia, Cavaniglia <clears throat> uh, he died in battle <laughs> at the age of like 21. Um, he was a condottiero and a count in from sort of northern half of Italy. Uh, he, trying to remember what he was the count of. Um, Sorry, I don't remember offhand. Uh, he was buried in highly fashionable garments that very clearly did not get reworked or were not upcycled from something else, right? He was, he, he, he had enough, um, he was young enough and powerful enough and well healed enough that he didn't need to um, <laughs> upcycle old garments. So those probably, the garments that were found in his tomb most likely reflect the state of the art fashion circa 1480, 1481. You know, unlike, say, um, the golden gown of Margaret of Denmark, as it's called, that's in quotes, which whose date is actually highly disputed and which also which does show signs of having been updated and reworked and resized over a period of multiple decades. So, <clears throat> you know, it's never as simple as we want it to be, this whole medieval clothing exploration. Never. I uh, thought I just looking at, apparently I didn't get my hands washed the way I thought I did. I washed my hands, but I should have scrubbed under the nails. Well, I wasn't quite awake yet. Um, I'm still, my body is still off kilter sleep wise. So I'm, some of you may have heard my woes at Penzik of not sleeping very much. And my body's still fighting me on the sleep front now that I'm here in Korea. But um, that means I didn't wake up very much earlier than the start of this live stream. And apparently I didn't clean under my fingernails as well as I should. And the reason that matters is that I am working in white linen and white thread. So if you ever work in white linen with white thread and or with white thread or any light colored garment, you definitely want to wash your hands pretty well because your skin, the oils on your skin, loves trapping the general detritus from the air, the dust, you know, anytime you touch something, there's a microscopic layer of, of material and that gets caught by the oils in your skin. And then the fabric will absorb that nasty, dirty oil. And then you end up with gray smudges everywhere that can be harder to get out because the oil from your skin is very pernicious. And the thread will especially 
pick up all of that dirty oil from your skin. And so you should try to wash your hands very thoroughly before you pick up white fabric and thread to sew. And apparently thoroughly was not on my docket this morning because <laughs> my fingernails look like I've been scratching around in the dirt, which is funny because I live in an, I currently am staying in an apartment, which means I don't have a yard and I literally can't scratch around in dirt. And yet the environment can just be so naturally dirty on its own, despite the fact that I have a Jeeves. Um, a Jeeves is a mopping and vacuuming robot, <laughs> robot thing that goes around and literally cleans and mops and, and vacuums every single day. And yet still, despite that, there still seems to always be a layer of dust that I'm constantly fighting. Anyway, first world problems. I'm going to just... Um, Okay, I'm just going to show you my progress thus far. So that's what it looks like. You can see that's coming along quite nicely. <clears throat> these pins, I love these pins. These are a really fine set of pins that I purchased in Florence uh, from a very nice embroidery shop there in the old city. And um, big tubbo pins. And they are fine. These are really nice fine pins. They're sharp. They're long. So I really like them because they don't poke big holes in my fabric. And they have relatively wide pin heads, so they don't go through the fabric either, which is very nice. And some of you have heard this before, but I'll mention it again. Pins were recognized as being a disposable item um, or a consumable item in the medieval world, because pins were used for everything, not just for sewing. Pins were used to pin clothing layers together, to pin clothing clothes, to pin veils and headdresses together. You know, what the things for which we use hooks and eyes and zippers, a lot of those functions were performed, or buttons even, a lot of those functions were performed by pins. People had a lot of pins in their garments. I have a lot of pins. And when I, when I go, <laughs> when I dress 15th century, whether it's Florentine or Burgundian, there's a lot of pins <laughs> in my various layers. <clears throat> and those pins, of course, go missing. They fall out and then, <laughs> and then my Jeeves vacuums them up and maybe I find them when I go to empty out his filter. Um, but pins were a, generally, that's where the, if you've ever heard the expression pin money, it's where the expression pin money comes from because they were a consumable item and uh, there was usually a separate line item in household accounts that, and specifically ladies usually had pin money um, for purchasing pins. And, you know, eventually when clothing kind of moved past the, the need <laughs> um, to have pins holding everything in place, the expression stayed on and pin money became a synonym for pocket money, right? For money that you just had to spend on quote unquote little items. But it used to be for a very important item, namely, the pins for your clothing, whether sewing or otherwise. So I actually, oh, right, in Florence. The reason I bought the pins in Florence, they, <laughs> I ran out of pins. I literally lost my last pin when we were in Florence this back in June, and I had no pins left. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to go find a place that sold pins. And I'm so happy that we found that embroidery shop because they had very nice needles also, but also this giant, this giant tub of pins, of very nice pins. And I did also buy, they had silk embroidery floss, not inexpensive. It was pretty expensive because it was not a wholesale shop. It was a, you know, retail shop, but I still bought, uh, several sets so that I could actually make, do the finger loop braiding out of that for the trim that I'm going to put around the neckline of this, this bodice when it's finally done. Um, and I'm, so I'm going to use silk that I bought in Florence to make the finger loop braiding to, for the trim for this. Ironically though, <laughs> the silk floss that I bought in Florence is not Italian made. I couldn't, they didn't sell any Italian made silk floss. I don't even know if there are any companies in Italy currently making silk embroidery thread or silk, silk thread of any kind. The, the thread I bought was made in the USA. 
and I bought it in Florence. So I don't know, Florentine by association? <laughs> but at least it has a story with it once I eventually get around to making it. And I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, there's a, there's an advanced finger loop braid that I actually teach in some of my finger loop braiding workshops called, it's a, makes chevron, very nice chevron. And um, there's a portrait, kind of a portrait that's commonly seen if you're looking at Florentine clothing of a lady and her husband actually, or, or fiance, we're not certain if they're married already or if it's a engagement portrait set. And um, <clears throat> if you look at the neckline of her collar, she's, she's a very round, she's a very busty woman. It's a busty blonde lady, very well endowed. Um, and she has this beautiful, very delicate coletto over top of it, but under the coletto, because it's very translucent, very, very saucy. <laughs> it hides her decollete. It does not hide it. <laughs> it just brings the eyes to it. Anyway, under the transparent coletto, you can actually see herringbone, um, this herringbone or chevron, chevron trim all the way around the neckline. And lo and behold, there is indeed in the English finger loop braiding sources, there is a braid, there are two braids actually, they make chevrons, that make a beautiful, exactly that, that trim. And we do know that they had finger loop braiding in Italy because there are extant, there are pouches and whatnot that still have finger loop braiding on them from the Middle Ages. We have no manuals, <clears throat> excuse me, from Italy describing finger loop braiding. Um, and actually I don't, think we have any, I've never found finger loop braiding mentioned explicitly in an in inventory or a purchase account, but I haven't looked through many Italian purchase accounts. I have to do more research in that regard. But that being said, the thing that's depicted in this portrait is very, it very much looks like this chevron finger loop braid. So I will be doing that as the trim for this garment. <clears throat> and I don't remember the colors that I chose. Um, it's been three months now, but I do remember I specifically chose colors that would complement this lovely salmon pink. Complement, but not, not match in the modern sense. Because of course the modern sense of matching is not, does not have anything to do with the medieval color palette. So, and you can tell that by reading these inventories, that their sense of colors that go together is much more vivacious and vibrant than our post-Victorian <laughs> sense of color. Um, the Victorians, you know, for women, the Victorian era was a very interesting fashion era. For men, it, it just got really boring. It's kind of sad what ended up happening. Men used to wear color. They really did. It was a thing. <clears throat> and not just the tie or cufflinks or maybe a shirt that peeks out from underneath of the suit coat. <laughs> so once I get this panel attached, I will then actually think the only thing I have left to do um, is the hem. And I mostly pinned the hem. I had a meeting earlier this week and I brought this with me and worked on pinning the part of the hem that I wouldn't have to alter much because I'm the kind of person who I really don't, I don't like sitting around and doing nothing. I mean, talking doesn't count as something, I guess. <laughs> so I really do like to have something in my hands. Uh, I like to be productive if I can, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> um, if you're watching, if you have any questions, just go ahead and pop them in the chat. Let's see, did I bring any other books of interest? Oh, uh, I did actually. Um, so there is a fabric historian called Margaret Scott who's done some publishing. A lot of uh, her books are um, a lot of people, a lot of medievalists have them in their in their collection, and they're useful for people just getting into it who want to get an idea of how garments looked. And I brought I I purchased her copy of Fashion in the Middle Ages um, to see what 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 it was about and get a feeling for it. And it has a lot of really good imagery from basically the 12th century through to the 15th century. And it even had some images I haven't necessarily seen, which says something because I've spent a lot of time looking at a lot of medieval imagery. But I will say the reason I brought this is not necessarily to encourage you to get this. You can if you want. The pictures are very, very good, um, are very interesting, but not necessarily good because 
she uses a lot of imagery that is depicting ancient legends, Old Testament scenes, allegorical scenes, fantastical scenes. And she uses those. And in her analysis, instead of saying, this is allegorical, this is probably not how people dress, she actually says things like, look, this is how a fashionable man dressed in the 15th century. And I'm like, that's Alexander the Great. That is not how a fashionable man dressed in the 15th century. That's how fashionable men thought Alexander the Great dressed in his time. So I know many of you have heard my cautionary speech before, but I'm just going to give it again because that book caught my eye and it made me think I should mention it, that art can be dangerous, not, not, not from the subversive sense of, you know, can overthrow tyrants, help over, overthrow tyrants, but um, it can present to you an image or an idea of, of how people dressed when that isn't how they dressed. When what the artist is trying to tell you is, this is how I think, this is how I think, um, you know, Julius Caesar dressed. And I'm dressing him this way so that you, the viewer, understands this is not, you know, the Duke of Milan, this is Julius Caesar. The Duke of Milan dresses a different way <laughs> and would be depicted differently. So it's, you know, it's really important to know um, that art, to know the context of your art. So know that if you're looking at an illumination, even if the illumination isn't captioned, see if you can read the text at all. <laughs> Even if you can just pick out a name, if you can just find the name Alexandre in the French text, for instance, you immediately know it's about Alexander the Great. Probably the illuminations are the way a medieval person imagined ancient Greek life was, right? Macedonian life, ancient Macedonian life was, how the court of Alexander the Great looked, how his soldiers looked, right? Not how a contemporary of that artist would have dressed, eaten, outfitted their house even. Even the tablewares that may be shown in those kinds of illustrations may or may not reflect actual medieval tablewares because again, the artist is trying to tell you, the viewer, this is fantastical, this is legendary, this is a man of legend, right? So just be cautious in your, in your when you're interpreting art or looking at art. Um, now, that doesn't mean that those pictures may not be useful. For instance, starting in, in the 15th century, especially, um, you know, they start they start having uh, costumed dances, dance performances, in which the nobility performed, not professional dancers, but in which the princes of the court, prince and princesses of the court would perform, and so they would actually wear costumes as they understood costumes to illustrate their characters. So if you had a dance that was illustrating, you know, something depicting Mars and Venus, then the dancers would be wearing a costume as a 15th century person understood it. And so if you want to do a 15th century style mask with these costume performances and you want your dancers in costume as a 15th century person would understand, then those sorts of paintings are where you get your ideas for costumes. So for instance, when I was still running dance at Penzik, one of the things, one year I made it, I held a grand ball where the theme was, um, was the classical era, was the ancient, was ancient Rome and ancient Greece, the Hellenistic world. And so people were encouraged to either come if they wanted in authentic ancient Greek, ancient Roman clothing, or to come dressed as an ancient Greek or ancient Roman person a la 15th century, right? A la antica, as a 15th century or 16th century or 14th century or whatever century person would have understood them. And so that was really fun because a lot of people did actually go and find those fun illuminations and make elements of those, those pictures to Ill in to make a medieval costume. And it was, yeah, it was really a lot of fun. And I, I love hosting balls and parties like that. So I kind of, I've developed a collection of actual 15th century costumes, fancy dress in that sense over the years. Hence my Phoenix costume, which I guess I should have brought if I was going to talk about it. I didn't think about it though. <clears throat> So yeah, that's my that's my art history admonishment. Um, and also even portraits. Portraits can be dangerous too um, because you have to know if it's a posthumous portrait or not. It's very popular 
in throughout the Middle Ages, um, histories, chronicles his, his, are are a very common part of medieval literature. They, you know, they kept they kept. You know, we we no longer have historians really, but they had actual historians who were literally recording events. And then over time, those chronicles would get recopied and illustrated. And so even if the chronicle was written in, say, 1310, if it's a 15th century copy of the chronicle, then the illuminations in the chronicle are going to be depicting what a 15th century person thought early 14th century people dressed and wore and ate and did. Right, so not an accurate representation of early 14th century material culture, but what they thought it looked like. So again, the artist is going to include elements that are fantastic, fantastical and imaginative to tell the viewer that this is not a contemporary, this is not your current king, duke, queen, princess. This is someone who died 150 years ago. And so again, even those so-called portraits you need to be careful about. So I always try to find when you're looking at art, if you're looking and you care about it being something that a real person would have worn, if you don't care, then you know it's fine, do whatever. But if you care about it being something a real person would have worn, then I always recommend trying to find a picture that was painted contemporary to the life of the person, ideally one that they themselves commissioned. Um, yeah, so in the case of a lot of altarpieces, you can find the donors who were alive and commissioned the painting and are therefore represented most likely pretty accurately in the in the altar piece. Now, their faces were probably beautified, <laughs> but their clothing is probably pretty accurate to what they actually would have worn for, you know, a very high state occasion, sort of wearing their absolute best in the, the portrait. So, you know, always know the context of the image that you are looking at. Know what it's depicting and then understand why it may or may not be depicting real a medieval reality and instead may de be depicting a medieval fantasy, actually. You know, medieval people had imaginations too. Pretty damn vivid imaginations. If you want to read a really crazy, a really crazy ride, Read the, the Marco Polo's adventures. Read his book of wonders. Oh my God, that is fun. That is really fun. <laughs> the supposed creatures and, and weird peoples that he encounters on his travels, it's great. Also reading about him describing the pagan rites that he observed is, yeah, disturbing but interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. I wonder if sound is still coming through. Well, I don't know. Well, it seems to be. Yeah, I see the little sound thingy popping up, so that's good. Okay, well, let me pull the pins out and show you my progress. This has been coming along quite nicely. So you can see kind of how it will lay or how it will hang. So the done part is over here. And you can see there are some, well, there's some pin, <laughs> some pin folds. This the good thing about linen, it takes it takes a crease so beautifully. Um, and this is how it will basically look when it's hanging. And I'm good with that. That is good enough for me. I I was wondering if I was going to fuss about some of the little light bubbling I kind of see happening there. Um, but, you know, I don't care enough <laughs> about a panel on the back bottom of my garment to take the time to fix that. Yeah. Oh, someone, I think someone commented that they wish they could sit cross-legged like this. So I've been training cross-legged sitting. Uh, we moved to Korea for the first time in 2014. And back then there was a lot more floor sitting happening in Korea than there is now. And we started training floor sitting because back then there were a lot of restaurants where you got to sit on the floor. And um, increased, decreasingly, that is the case though. Many 
I would say the vast majority of restaurants um, in, especially in the cities, maybe in the country, not so much, but especially in the cities, the vast majority of restaurants have Western style seating. And sometimes they'll have a section for both. They'll have a Western section and a, a floor, a, a Korean section, but that is decreasingly the case. And I know a lot of Koreans who don't even sit on the floor very well anymore. <laughs> But it is something you do have to train. We really break ourselves in the West with our chairs, literally. Like it's, it, there's been studies done about the non ergonomics of chair sitting and the kind of damage it actually does to your skeletal frame over the years, and how that can lead to all have all sorts of knock on health effects. And so, yeah, we have to practice floor sitting. And my poor condottiero, he has such issues with floor seating. Um, way more than I do. I, I will admit that my legs will still fall asleep if I don't shift them. If I stay in the same cross-legged position for too long. <clears throat> so let's see other books I brought with me. Oh, Ricordance. Uh, so for those who are interested in 15th century Italian stuff, um, the uh, Ricordance Ricordanza, ricordanze is the plural, is a must source, primary source for garments. And I found this on an Italian website, I think. Um, so the families, the great families in Italy, not even great, the families in Italy, uh, middle class and up, if, if they could afford to purchase things, they kept these ricordanze memoirs, which is translated as memoir and it's it's not very accurate because a memoir, you know, for us in English, it's like a, it's, it's more of a diary kind of thing. This is more of an accounting of daily activities that also includes things like clothing purchases, donations, what happened in the family, so-and-so was born, so-and-so died. So it's more of a chronicle of the family over time. And um, so various families kept these and increasingly they're being published, <laughs> transcribed and published. And so this is um, this is for the Martelli family, Ugolino, Ugolino di Niccolo Martelli. Um, and so this, this ricordanza covers 1430 to 1483, so a 50 year period. So you can also see how things change. But I found one particular page, you know, there's all these garments are mentioned. Um, and one that I thought was interesting is, um, it says here, there's one item, um, a, a, a sopra vesta, an overdress, a knight's overdress made of taffeta lined in a Vallecio Rosso. And I didn't have time to find out what Vallecio is, but it's a kind of fabric, but it actually talks about the lining of this garment. Remember I said it can be very hard to identify the linings of garments because they tend to not be mentioned unless they're they're fine. And the fact that this thing is red, because that's what rosso means. And Vallecio, I'm going to assume, is probably some expensive fabric. Um, so, you know, and this is in this, this so-called memoir. And, you know, this, this is part of an entire um, itemized list of, um, of garments that, yeah, it's an inventory of garments as of the date of, let me see, 1452, I think, is the date on this one. They don't, 1451, 1451, yeah, 1451. So, you know, these, these memoirs are a really great source. So if you look up Ricordanza or Ricordanze, um, you can often find sometimes digitized versions, and then you don't need to buy the book. Um, but you can often find these in various places. Um, and you know, the increasingly state art city archives in Italy are digitizing. So if you know the right search terms, then you can you can often find these even online. Um, this I'm pretty certain I bought from an Italian bookseller. Yeah. I think I bought from an Italian bookseller. And then sometimes if you find a printer or a publisher that's publishing one of these, and then you look at their catalog, if you find one book, if you look at the, go to the publisher's website and you look at their catalog of items, you'll find that they have a whole bunch more of this kind of thing, which I haven't, I just thought to do that. I haven't done that yet. I'm going to go do that later on today and see if there are other Ricordance um, 
that might be of interest to me. Another place where one can sometimes find inventories that are not available on the open market are museum gift stores, especially in Italy. Um, at the Bargello, I actually found, I noticed on the top shelf of their book section of their gift store, I noticed these dusty old tan books. And I noticed the word inventario. And it turns out that up on the top shelf, God knows for how many decades, had been sitting copies of the Medici inventory, not the Lorenzo de Medici inventory, his father's inventory, his grandfather's inventory, and his great-grandfather's inventories, all taken at the time of their death, each of their death in turn. And um, I, I bought them. They were expensive. They were 130 euros. <laughs> but I bought them. Um, and because these are not, we, we did a quick Google search. They are not in print. They are not available. You can't even, a Google search didn't even find these books at all. They, at that time, they didn't exist as far as the internet was concerned. So we bought those babies and I was so proud. It was really interesting details of garments in there. And then when the movers came to move our things and to put half of our things into storage, I wasn't paying close attention about which books were on which bookshelves. And so my Medici inventories are now in storage for an indefinite amount of time. I'm very sad. A lot of things ended up in storage that shouldn't have ended up in storage. But yeah, museum, museum gift shops, especially in Europe, uh, can, be, can be amazing troves of, of information and books that aren't generally, they're not, they're not just commonly available. Like you can't just get them on the open market. So especially if it's um if it's a publishing house, like it's the museum's own, like self-published by the museum. Uh, they're probably not, you know, th th those books aren't going to make the bestseller list. Um, and they're definitely not, you know, basically a copy of inventories or not. There's no exciting analysis. There's no melodrama around them. So yeah, good place to find stuff, museum bookshops. Uh, especially if you look on the top most dustiest shelves. <laughs> so let's see, I think those are all the books I actually just grabbed to share with you today. <clears throat> um, I was... Uh, reading, I was looking through something recently. Oh, Margaret Scott's book. So this version, I think the thing that d disappointed me the most about this um, was that I was hoping she would include, this is uh, for those just from fashion in the Middle Ages. The thing that disappointed me the most about this was that um, it, it didn't provide any documentary supporting, supporting documentary evidence. What, she has a larger book, um, Margaret Scott Medieval Fashion, I think. It's a, it's a larger book. I can, I can highly recommend that one because she in that one, she includes a lot of supporting documentary evidence to coincide with and corroborate the visual pieces that she provides. I also feel that in that book, the visual, the visual evidence she provides is much more real visual evidence instead of fantastical, allegorical, legendary, or historical. So I can recommend, I should have grabbed that one as a contrast. Oh, well, sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, I should have grabbed that as a contrast. I can recommend that book. That's that's good. It's useful for giving an oversight, uh, sort of a survey of medieval fashion. And she covers not just like England or just France. She covers different parts of Europe, which is nice. And um, it, it also can provide you with new directions of research you know, because all those little quotes, all those little excerpts from historic documents, I always, the footnotes can sometimes be the most valuable part of any book <laughs> or any essay. The footnotes can point you in the direction of sources you may not have been aware of at all, and in many cases, primary sources. So, you know, and sometimes those primary sources are digitized, so you don't have to go to, you know, 
um, the Universitätsbibliothek in Heidelberg. You can <laughs> go to their website and they have a digital collection and you can look at the original manuscripts there, for instance. So yeah, that's another tip in general. If you're reading essays, let me see these essays. Yes, footnotes. Ah, yes, <laughs> footnotes. If you're reading essays or books with footnotes, look at the footnotes. The footnotes can be really highly valuable. And sometimes the footnotes actually contain original language that isn't included in the main body of the text. Sometimes there's a translation provided in either the footnote or the body, and the, the original language is in the other. So yeah, always read the footnotes. And often those footnotes are going to point you in a whole new research direction that will open up entire doors of revelation for you. So footnotes for the win. Now I'm getting close to the end of this thread. Well, not this thread, this line of thread. Um, speaking of which, if you hand sew, then beeswax for the win. Um, I actually, I didn't know, but there is, because I don't do very much modern sewing with modern equipment. Um, uh, I didn't know that there was a um, modern thread wax option made of like paraffin or something. Why? Why? Beeswax is the best for waxing your thread. Not just authentic, but the best option for waxing your thread, in my opinion. So if you are hand sewing, wax your thread. And also, do not make the thread too long. Because the longer you make your thread, the more likely there will be snags um, and knots that will form, although the wax will prevent knots in many cases. But also, every time you go up and down, pull your needle up and down through that fabric, the thread has to go through all of it, right? It's not like a sewing machine where the thread only goes through the exact part that it sews. All the length of thread goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And so that creates wear and tear. So, you know, it's okay over, you know, for a little while, but if your thread you have long, long thread, then that's a lot of wear and tear. And so the back half of your thread is going to get really weak, um, even with waxing. So I recommend a sort of medium length of thread. So usually, usually I, if I'm, I do that long, so that's like, I guess that's actually an L. <laughs> that's kind of funny. Um, so usually, yeah, I make it about an L. <laughs> uh, uh. Um, I guess I've been doing medieval sewing for too long. The measurements have worked themselves into my brain. And, and if I double my thread, then that doubled, right? Um, that, that seems to be a good medium, happy medium between constantly rethreading and thread that's so long that it, it wears and tears and snaps and knots and is just unwieldy to work with. So I think once I finish this, which I'm about to, I will call that good on today's So in Chat. I've actually been holding forth for about an hour and 50 minutes, although there was sadly a big part where the sound wasn't coming through and I didn't notice all the comments telling me there was no sound. <sighs> Sigh. Uh, so last chance for those of you who are still watching. Um, do you have any questions before we part company? Any requests for the next Sew in Chat? I think I might make this a weekly event, actually. And it will probably be a Monday morning my time, Sunday evening Americas. <laughs> I might, I, I know then my European viewers can't really tune in. So mm, I'll have to think about that. The problem with, the problem <laughs> with having followers all over the world, I know. That's a, that's a real hashtag Contessa world problem. Um, if you are uh, if you are just tuning in and didn't hear my plea, please do hit the thumbs up. Oh, and if you really want to support my channel, once this publishes, if you could leave a comment under the published video, like in the actual comments after the live stream ends, that would be great because it really helps push my work and push the algorithm and make YouTube realize that I'm a wonderful creator that produces quality content and not just stupid videos of people falling into pools accidentally or whatever. I tell you, my most popular video, the one that went almost instantly, like hit the thousands in an hour, was a short, was the short I did at the end of Penzik showing the sun fading through on the, 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 the roof, the canopy, top of my silk bed canopy, showing how UV light penetrates through canvas pavilions. 
because I figured it out the beginning of that video, I start by accidentally saying, oh shit. <laughs> and the algorithm picked up on that and decided that that must be something that people want to see and watch. And apparently it was. It made about 3,000 people watch that video in an hour. So apparently quality content is not what's wanted. It's profanity. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So two good questions. First question. Near the beginning of my chat, um, you mentioned that we don't have any real collections from Italy. Um, is there anything other than paintings that we can use for primary, secondary source? Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. We do have collections from Italy. I'm just not... There are extant garments from Italy. There are. But it's not the same as the Langberg finds. So the garments that we have from Italy, and actually more are coming to light. The extant garments that we have from Italy tend to be either the surviving garments of saints. <laughs> um, uh, so that is a certain class of person, or they tend to be the surviving garments of very upper aristocracy. Um, and it's it's a few. There are a few. There are definitely a few, and they're absolutely worth making. Um, the Beata Osana, the Blessed Osana, her Gamora, I talk about her Gamora a lot in my the project vlog series on this. There's a whole project vlog series about making the whole dress and I talk about and uh, provide imagery of her thing. Very helpful. Um, there's extant garments in uh, the Capella Maggiore in, or San, San, Santo Domingo Maggiore in Naples. Also of like, but of the King's, the, the Royal House of Naples. Um, there's Diego di Cavanilla's garments. Uh, St. Francis's, tun one of St. Francis's tunics survives. I think St. Clair, one of St. Clair's garments survives. So they're there. They exist. Oh, crap. My battery's running low. Okay, everyone, we're going to go for a little walk. I apologize while I finish up these questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for the lower middle classes is where it gets trickier. So there is where we're unfortunately for the lower and middle classes, we are generally left to use, to fill in the blanks, hold on, with garments, say, from Langberg, because, welcome to my office. <laughs> I work on an elliptical cross trainer. Anyway, um, for lower and middle classes in Italy, uh, your, your best information could be, actually, the shirt from St. Francis of Assisi might provide some ideas, because he lived, of course, a very modest life. So actually, some of those saints' garments, if they're if they if they are in fact modest, and Saint Francis's um, tunic is it's modest, it's like this very plain spun wool thing, um, and I think Saint Clair's is as well. So yeah, there are some items for Italy, but that's also for a specific period. That's like the 13th century, early 14th century. So there, you know, when you're looking for lower middle class information, there I would use the Langberg finds to help fill in the gaps because it's better than nothing. And Austria isn't that far away from Italy, at least the northern part of Italy. And there was there was a lot of, God knows, there was a lot of cross-cultural interchange between the Italys and Austria, you know, those trade routes that go through there, mercantile lines, interdynastic marriages, you know, there's all kinds of records from the 15th century, especially, of Italians being in, in the Holy Roman Empire and people from the Holy Roman Empire being in Italy and being influenced by each other's fashions. So... Yeah, um, it's just not as nice as the Langberg finds. Um, yeah. Uh, so primary, for for the middle classes and the lower classes in Italy, your primary, your, your sources are going to be, even there, actually, you can find things in the Medici inventories because they, the inventories also mention the servant's clothing. So yeah, you can even still find things in the inventories of the mercantile classes and even the upper classes because they do often talk about their servants' clothing because, of course, the master of the house, the head of the familia, is the one who provided, or the lady of the house, they provided the clothing for their servants. So you can still find it even, even there. Um, let's see, then the, uh, let me know if, oh, good, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, and then um, another question was, um, the comment is trying to wrap my head around how they judge quality back then, if not for perfect stitches, was it just based on the material? Yes. I mean, 
their idea of perfect stitches was different than our idea of perfect stitches. And that's probably because the machine is what gave us, is what gives us our idea of perfect stitches, right? A machine that can create exactly the same length at exactly all the time, always, unless the machine buggers up, but for the most part, always. I think that is where the modern idea of perfect stitches comes from. So our idea of perfection is heavily influenced by machine perfection, whereas a 15th century eye would not have been influenced by machine perfection. Smallness of stitches, yes, but not necessarily that every single stitch is exactly the same length the way we think of. Yeah, so I think I think that it's just they they still thought, you know, stitches needed to look nice, but their idea of what was neat was not quite the same as our idea of what was neat because of the way machines have influenced our ideas about that. Um, I think they were also much more flexible about, uh, you know, you know, matching, you know, patterning, matching of patterns in a, in a, if you're using a pattern fabric, you know, we modernly, this doesn't match. So that's a bad example, but <laughs> modernly, a lot of people try, will try very hard and they'll waste a lot of fabric to match up the patterns exactly. And that is whew, absolutely not a medieval idea at all, because that is so incredibly wasteful. So that also influenced you know, visually, they had a different idea. So yeah, quality of fabric definitely would have mattered. The quality of tailoring would have mattered too. You know, the way the garment hangs, how even everything is, the state of the fabric, whether it's in good condition or not, because of course, they as things got passed down to, you know, subsequent servants, um, wear and tear. So all of that would have, would have um, quality and the quality of the dye stuff density of the color, vibrancy of the color. Yeah, that all would have gone, fallen into. And I don't mean to say that, you know, there were seams that were just falling off and, uh, you know, things were sloppy. It's just that it was a slightly less exacting idea of perfection back then. You know, things were still even, hems were still even, um, just other things not so much. Yeah. <clears throat> Ooh, finishing up an Elizabethan style flat cap that you've been working during the last couple of events. Well, that's uh, definitely someone said, yeah, I'm finishing up an Elizabethan style flat cap that I've been working during the last couple of SCA events. Well, that's certainly a better rate of production than I've been managing. <laughs> All of these garments that I've been working on, I've dragged them thousands upon thousands of miles around the globe over the last several years in an attempt to finish them, and it just hasn't happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any other questions before we part ways, my dear fellow fellow followers? Thank you all. Well, while I wait for the last couple of questions, um, last final questions, I'll just say thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate your dedication. I hope you feel like you've benefited from our time together. I actually did get some sewing done, so I didn't just talk. Yay. Often what happens at these stitch and chats is I get on these pedagogical lecture spates and I forget to actually sew, but I managed to actually stitch while talking. Go me. <laughs> um, otherwise, I hope to see you all at the next one. And I'm going to hopefully this week, oh, sorry, hopefully this week I will be publishing my dressing the Burgundian Contest video where I dress in all the layers from the skin out um, with the help of a lady in waiting. So have a lovely day, everyone. And if you have more questions, just put them in the under the video once it publishes. And again, if you can, do go hit the thumbs up and leave a comment under the video when it publishes. Okay, everyone. Until next time, stay creative. Have a great evening, morning, afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. Bye, everyone. <laughs>